I think it was a Monday morning. And in those days I would get up at like five or five 30 in the morning and go to the gym. And I had done that. And when I got to the gym for whatever reason, I tweeted out something funny about, Oh, it's another Monday and we've still got, you know, block size wars in front of us for the whole week. And, and apparently, you know, the attacker saw that and made the assumption that I had just rolled out of bed. And so, you know, I was going to be at home for the next hour or so. And so they decided, you know, like 7 AM was the perfect time to strike. And so I was coming home from the gym and I run into a roadblock, you know, stop and talk to the cop and they're like oh we have a potential active shooter incident <laughs> and so i of course got uh, pretty concerned it wasn't uh until i don't know it took like another 20 or 30 minutes or so uh before we realized that you know they were actually looking for me they were you know at my address Are you or your loved ones looking to secure and manage your Bitcoin with confidence? The Bitcoin Advisor is your premier destination for professional Bitcoin management, helping you buy, secure and manage your Bitcoin so you can own intergenerational wealth and sleep easy. With a reputation built on unparalleled security, strategic planning and comprehensive client education, the Bitcoin Advisor team have managed over $1 billion in assets without losing a single Satoshi since 2016. Whether you're new to Bitcoin or a seasoned investor, the Bitcoin Advisor team are there to guide you every step of the way. So please click on the link below to organize yourself a consultation and include the name Carrie, C-A-R-R-I, in the referral code so that they know that I've sent you their way. I am so honored to have with me today Jameson Lup, who is co-founder and CTO of CASA and professional cypherpunk, Welcome to Bitcoin people, Jameson. Glad to be here and to meet another Bitcoin person. It's lovely of you to be here. You are enormously patient. You've been in the space since 2012. So that's over 10 years now. And you continue to give your time to new folk in the space. And you are insanely patient and kind in coming on board here today and i really appreciate it uh, what i would love to do jameson is to go back a little bit in time go back in history to you as a child i want you to take us briefly through some of your career history and then we're going to get into your bitcoin life you were always an insanely smart human being you were reading well above your year level at school. Uh, what was that like for you? I would love to just get a sense of what you were like as a kid and how those years uh, shaped you as a person. What was your experience of that? Sure. I mean, the short version of how I would describe it is I was the sort of stereotypical outcast nerd. Um, I was an only child. My parents were very focused on my academic learning. You know, they were, uh, you could call it very supportive, uh, or you could also say they were uh, very insistent uh, that, you know, academics come before everything else. And um, oddly, though, they were anti like computer, like they saw computers just as video game machines. Uh, so uh, I actually did, I begged for a computer, uh, I think basically as soon as I learned what one even was, uh, and my friends had them because I had friends whose parents were actually software engineers. Um, but I did not get a computer until I was in middle school. Once I did, it was just off to the races, uh, you know, really, ingesting as much information as possible, like teaching myself how to create websites. Um, and then, you know, ended up taking college level computer science class, I think when I was like a freshman in high school or something. Um, and, you know, my sort of 
interest in computers and computer science just grew from there. But um, I guess you could say I was always pretty intellectual because I, I probably, I spent more time with books than with humans for a lot of my early childhood, at least like when I was outside of school was literally getting wagons of books from the library. You had a special exemption uh, to go over their sort of maximum number of checked out books. And, you know, that, that helped my education, uh, but it also harmed, I think, my uh, social uh, side of things because it just made me weirder and nerdier and more outcast because I would make references to things and use words that you know my peer group didn't know. And so they, they basically thought that in many cases I was speaking a foreign language. Yeah, I, I find it interesting that, and we can get into all of this stuff as the conversation unravels, but you had that experience as a child, you been subject to a swatting attack that we will discuss a little bit more in detail, sort of as we get there in the timeline of your life. You get a bit of pushback from the community about your stance on Ethereum and certain alts and where you stand on layer twos and kind of up and coming technologies in, in the altcoin space. You have every right to be incredibly wary around people and yet you uh, continue to show up to new programs like this to be a really involved member of the community and you handle you handle people and you handle pushback and criticism with enormous grace and calm where does that come from yeah i mean i think a lot of it really was due to getting interested in stoicism when i was in middle school um, that certainly shaped a lot of my views on life and it, it did give me i think a sense of calmness and a, a reliance upon you know rational thinking critical thinking um, logical discourse and you know, that sort of along with the fact that I, I was, you know, bullied a lot as a, a child, uh, had to deal with, you know, people basically using their emotions rather than their logic on me and, you know, seeing uh, the sort of negative consequences of that, uh, that, that certainly molded my perspective, uh, gave me also a strong sense of justice. So, you know, that ties into some of some of the stuff that happened after my swatting of, of seeking out justice on my own and and also just my interest in the space in general. One of the several reasons why I initially got interested in Bitcoin and then started going down the rabbit hole and learning about the cypherpunks, uh, it really was the promise of being able to empower individuals more you know against oppression and that's what really i would say gave my life a sense of purpose is yeah i always liked computers and i spent the first decade of my career solving interesting problems but i i never had uh, a real commitment to the industry I was working in. And once I started going down these rabbit holes, I really decided not so much that I wanted to commit myself to Bitcoin, but I wanted to commit myself to using my skills as a technologist to empower people, to build tooling, to disseminate knowledge and information of how to use these tools that have been created so that they can leverage really an immense amount of power for themselves. You know, this has always been the promise of cryptography and then the promise of Bitcoin is that you can empower yourself. But that promise, it's been out of reach for a lot of people for a variety of different reasons. And, and this is really what I've been doing full time for the past eight years is trying to make it easier for people to attain the, the level of defensibility and, and sovereignty that I've been able to do since I joined the Bitcoin community. 
So let's go down that track. Let's talk about what happened to you when you first came across the white paper. And I'm going to quote here from Cointelegraph. There's an article or an interview that was done with you. Bear with me. I'm going to quote a few sentences here, about three sentences. I was just blown away, he says. This is you, you say, uh, noting that Satoshi approached the double spending and Byzantine generals problem from the exact opposite direction of the performance and efficiency mindset Lot had been taught. When I read the white paper and I saw the solution to the problem, I was amazed because it was both elegant and ass backward, he says. The solution was to make everything really, really expensive in terms of resource usage. I was like, wow, I never in a million years would have thought to try that because it just goes against our nature as computer scientists. So yep. I, I've heard this before, but I suppose when I read that, I got it, it helped me get inside the mind of a computer scientist seeing this thing from the first time and lighting up with the kind of excitement of coming across something so new. So take me through that experience, if you wouldn't mind. What happened for you when you first read that white paper? And then I want to broaden out into the context of 2012. So let's just talk about your white paper experience first. Yeah, so you know, I'll never remember for certain, um, but I'm pretty sure that I read the white paper as a result of a Slashdot post. And Slashdot is just a new site for nerds. It was a lot bigger back in the day. This was before places like Reddit uh, and Y Combinator uh, existed. And so I had read a number of different technical white papers over the years. And usually I found them incredibly dense and boring and with, you know, a lot of mathematical equations that I didn't even care to try to dig into. And, you know, the Bitcoin white paper was different uh, for several reasons, but the first was it was just so approachable. You know, it was only like eight or nine pages. It was written in fairly plain English. It did not have much technical jargon. It did a good job of explaining the new terms that were in the white paper. And, you know, then when it was explaining what the problem was, I actually found it quite fascinating because I had never thought about the problem before. I'd never, like most people, never even really thought about money. You know, how does money work? You you generally just use it as it's presented to you. And as long as it meets your needs, you don't really question what's going on behind the scenes. So, you know, we got through this white paper and I started mulling over it. You know, I, I thought, you know, it seemed like it made sense. It seemed like it could work. I wasn't convinced that, oh my goodness, this is the absolute you know, savior for all the world's monetary problems, but I didn't see any major holes in it uh, right off. And I already knew at the time it had been running for several years. And this was part of the reason why I read the white paper is because it wasn't the first time I'd heard about Bitcoin. I had definitely heard about it a few times over the past couple of years. And I had always just assumed, oh, this is another, you know, nerd game that a bunch of people are going to put their money into and lose everything. It's going to end horribly. So, you know, the fact that it continued existing uh, on the internet, which is a very adversarial environment, it, it made me realize I wanted to understand it better and that it could be an interesting long-term project. And so, you know, the only way to really learn more about Bitcoin is to actually start using it. So I immediately went out and I performed my first ever wire transfer. It was actually an international wire transfer to this uh, little bank in Tokyo. And uh, it took like a week for it to go through. I had to spend several hours at the bank filling out paperwork, had to uh, get lectured by them several times uh, <laughs> to, to for basically to make them confident that I wasn't getting scammed and that I understood that once the money left the bank account, that there was pretty much no way to get it back. And, you know, that was also an interesting experience because I didn't know it at the time, but that experience was about to really give me a, a ruler 
a sort of gauge of how difficult it was to send money internationally because I had never even tried to do that before uh, via you know the traditional system versus of course Bitcoin. Once I eventually got that uh, account set up at uh, MT Gox and and got my first Bitcoins purchased and uh, and thankfully withdrawn. Um, you know, a lot of people say that uh, you know Gox was. Um, you know, caught them by surprise or, or whatever if they were around back in the day. But it the the collapse of that exchange was not a surprise at all to me because you know I was a web developer. I had been building you know internet applications for a number of years, and I I saw how poorly written and executed their their web application was. So I did not trust them for a moment. Uh, you know, to hold on to my money for me. Thankfully, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people I guess were not quite so savvy. So, uh, you know, that was just the beginning. And for the first year or so, I was just, you know, subscribing to like the Bitcoin subreddit and Bitcoin talk and really the, the small number of places where people were actually talking about this thing because it, it was not really talked about on Twitter or other mainstream um, social media. And uh, about a year later, I decided, OK, I want to get more technical. And that's when I launched. A, a side project where I basically forked Bitcoin Core and I added in a bunch of instrumentation and, and metrics collection. What I was really doing is the same stuff that I had been doing for the past several years at my full-time job, uh, sort of a DevOps type of uh, infrastructure monitoring, trying to, you know, bring things to the surface so that you could understand what was going on, you know, on your machines as they were running. And I, I felt like, you know, this was a good way to contribute to Bitcoin because Bitcoin is all about transparency and openness. And I felt like when you were running an actual Bitcoin node, you weren't really sure what it was doing and that, you know, there was room for better understanding and improvement. And so that was a nice, uh, you know, initial project that it got referenced by a number of developers over the years. Uh, so I, I felt like that was a success. And then about a year after that was when enough venture capital started flowing into the system, enough jobs started getting posted. I realized, you know, this was a good opportunity for me to make a switch because I was already spending so much of my time thinking about Bitcoin stuff. I might as well just get paid to do it. <laughs> Indeed, and we're all the more grateful for it. So that's what was going on for you personally. Contextually around you, a lot was going on in the Bitcoin space. At the time that you got in, there was, so you're talking about my, Mt. Gox. You've got, uh, you're at the tail end of the WikiLeaks transitioning or, or taking Bitcoin payments. So moving from PayPal to Bitcoin. You've got the first halving in 2012. So there's a range of, oh, and Silk Road is still going. Mm -hmm. And Ross Ulbricht and kind of all of that space. How, how involved were you with any of that? How familiar were you with the community involved in all of that? What was, what was it like to be involved in all of those elements of what I'm going to call milestone events in Bitcoin's history at the personal level, how exposed were you to any of that? And what was the kind of talk amongst the community online? Yeah, well, I mean, you have to understand that the earliest wave of adopters back then were ideologues. Uh, we were the libertarians. Uh, we were the crypto anarchists. We were the nerdy computer scientists who might also be libertarians, crypto anarchists and whatever. You know, I kind of came in with a, a blend of several different perspectives that made me interested in this as a project. And it was a really niche community. So, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that was being talked about were, you know, the small number of projects that existed there. There was not a very diverse number of things that you could do with Bitcoin back then. I mean, it was considered cool when you could, um, you could pay this guy in Bitcoin to send you, you know, baklava or uh, alpaca socks. You know, those were novelties that anybody would even accept it in return for anything else. 
And, um, you know, it was, it was, you know, those first, you know, early purchases of being able to actually receive a, a physical good in return for Bitcoin that also it clicked again, where I realized, okay, you know, this, this is a real thing. There are people out there who agree with me that it has value and we can, we can engage in economic interactions. And, you know, the, the, the only real question at the time was, okay, how far can we take this? And so of course, Silk Road was the extreme example. And, you know, I, I puttered around on Silk Road. Uh, I wanted to you know, understand it as well. Never actually interacted with it or, you know, made any orders. And the main reason for that was didn't, I was just too paranoid. Drugs. Didn't buy your drugs on that? I, I did not. I was too paranoid because I could never convince myself uh, that the the kind of last mile problem of actually having the the physical delivery of the goods, you know, sent to my house. I, I was never convinced that that was safe enough. So you know, I didn't want to get busted with you know drugs showing up uh, on my doorstep. Uh, you know, I suppose there's like plausible deniability and whatnot, but I don't know. It always seemed too risky to me, and. Um, and of course, you know, there there was the issue of the sort of privacy of the actual Bitcoin that you were using. Now, Silk Road had a mixer, and so I think that that gave some people um, more conviction that it was safe and private. But really, um, you know, our understanding of Bitcoin privacy a decade ago was not that great, and. Uh, you know, we've learned over the years that you have to be really, really careful if you're doing anything that is creating an immutable public record for all time. Yes, indeed. Uh, and it's interesting that you were already so aware of privacy and yet even someone like you still got caught out later down the track. Let me just, before we get there, talk about the block size wars because on a timeline, they came next. They came around 2015, I'm going to say, 2016. Yeah, I mean, it was a slow burn up, right? I mean, people had been talking about scalability probably since, well, really, uh, it was since the original announcement thread um, yeah. that Satoshi sent. People were saying it would never scale. And so, you know, there, there was always a sort of background rumbling of people talking about scaling there were a few times early on i th i think in the like 2013 2014 era where um bitcoin initially had no block size limit i think in late 2009 or early 2010 satoshi set that one megabyte block size limit and this was never a problem until around 2013 or so. And I think it was um, Satoshi Dice, which was run by Eric Voorhees, uh, that generated so much demand that we didn't hit that one megabyte block size limit. But what, what happened was back then we had these soft block size limits that were set by the miners. I think it was initially 250 kilobytes. And then we hit that, and I think a bunch of the miners upped it to 500, and then we hit that, and they upped it to 750, and then eventually we hit the hard cap uh, within you know uh, a few years. And, and once the hard cap started getting hit, and there was nowhere else to go, you know that's when the the debate uh, with the the block size and and all of the the scaling proposals really went full force. Did it get nasty? Or were people reasonably civil about it? Or and, <laughs> and what was your experience of that? And where did you? I, I think you changed your mind at some point. Correct. Didn't you? Yeah. Tell me about that, and tell me about not only the changing of your mind, but how people perceived that amongst the community. The fact that you would change your mind on that. Yeah. So. Um... I think one important bit of context is that, you know, when I first went full time into Bitcoin, my job at BitGo was to run infrastructure, uh, basically, that was in charge of indexing the blockchain and all of its data and was responsible for managing our transaction sending queue. Mm -hmm. Now, 
as a result of this, uh, our, our early indexers were all built on top of Bitcoin J, which was one of the very early Bitcoin client implementations written in Java. And it was, I believe, initially started by Mike Kern, and I think Matt Corallo was also involved. But um, at the time, Mike Kern was really the, the primary maintainer of Bitcoin J. So I interacted with Mike, Mike Kern a fair amount, you know, whenever I came across issues with uh, using Bitcoin J. And he and I had very similar approaches and perspectives to Bitcoin. And this was because we, we both had similar jobs, um, at least before we got into Bitcoin. So he was working at Google, you know, doing a very large scale uh, computing. And I had been working at an email um, marketing service where I was running infrastructure and was responsible for basically running jobs that were, they were tasked with, with running across these, you know, hundreds of, of server clusters of, you know, hundreds of petabytes of raw analytics data that got generated as a result of the hundred million emails that got sent out through our system every day and all of the, you know, clicks and opens and, and other tracking metrics that came back. So point being, you know, we had this uh, DevOps mindset and there's, there's, there's really, there's a, a capacity planning aspect to DevOps when you're running infrastructure for large scale applications. And, and that basically falls along the lines of, you know, you can't just like run at 90% or a hundred percent capacity, even though that might be more efficient, cost efficient for you as an organization, because there tend to be spikes in demand. Demand is very rarely this you know, constant thing. Mm -hmm. um, and this is true for basically anything. Um, you know, uh, for example, just from the fact that, you know, we have waking and sleeping cycles, you often see, you know, daily and nightly demand that goes along basically as the sun is crossing over different populated areas of the earth or, you know, weekly cycles because people are at work or people are uh, at home or out and about. Uh, so we had issues at my company because we were a marketing company where you know, we would have to have uh, excess capacity really anywhere from three to five X of what our normal demand was. And this was because on certain days, the you know, internet retail industry they create a lot of sales. So be that like your Black Friday, your Cyber Monday, you know, uh, the time is basically coming up to Christmas or other major holidays. And if you don't have that excess capacity available, what happens? Well, you know, people hit these hard limits, things start to fail, your customers get pissed off, your customers may leave for a different service that has better capacity planning. And so this was really the, the perspective that he and I and a number of other engineers in the space had, which is that it's not good for us to be hitting this hard cap because that means people's transactions aren't going through, they're getting a bad user experience, they're gonna seek out alternatives, and that is going to result in you know, constrained demand for Bitcoin and thus a, probably a lower value for Bitcoin because it can't meet all of the demand. And uh, you know, it took me a while, but it was actually a direct result of me, you know, running this infrastructure and seeing how difficult it was to scale um, with larger and larger blockchains that it helped me understand that, you know, that was not the highest priority for the system as a whole. Um, that, you know, there were plenty of alternatives out there for people to make cheap transactions on and and really, even back then, there were already you know, thousands of altcoins. Like it was very easy for someone to spool up an altcoin network, and it would be really cheap to transact because you know there was no demand for those resources. 
So what was the atmosphere at the time? What was the, uh, the, the same way that you're talking about capacity and spikes, there's been spikes in the culture of Bitcoin, I'm going to say, over the years. There's times where it's more acrimonious and there's times where it's more peaceful. Uh, and you've weathered a lot of that along the way. Just tell me about for what it's worth. And it may not, I mean, maybe there's not all that much to it. But what was your experience of that like online? What was the backlash you got at the time? What were, you know, yeah. How yeah. You... Um, so I was an early proponent of Bitcoin XT, which was a proposed hard fork, I think basically to eight megabyte blocks, which, you know, eight times larger. Yep. And um, I ran a Bitcoin XT node for a while. I was a moderator of the Bitcoin XT subreddit for a while. And, you know, when when talking to the people who voluntarily joined that community, it was fine, of course, because we all had similar perspectives, but, you know, wider on Bitcoin Twitter or actually even on the, the networks themselves, it was certainly adversarial. The best example that I can give actually is that at one point, my entire home internet connection got knocked offline for mm, over a day. And this was basically, I think it was, it was deemed to be a, a DNS reflection attack, but, but suffice to say that someone or some ones uh, who did not like the idea of the Bitcoin XT and hard forking, they basically d did a denial of service attack on all of the Bitcoin XT nodes that they could find running on the network. And it just happened to be a type of attack that my ISP literally, they had no defense for. Like my ISP literally just shut off my account and said, you know, we'll let you back on the internet when the attack stops. So, um, you know, I think that was a good example uh, that there have been similar attacks in the next few years as other alternative, you know, Bitcoin fork implementations came up and uh, certain engineers would basically uh, look into their code and sometimes they would find an exploit and actually be able to like send a command to these nodes that caused them to crash and you would see these massive spikes and declines in node counts on the network going up and down as people were trying to figure out how to to fix these nodes and then you know exploit them again so you know this is why i say you know you know bitcoin is an adversarial environment the, the internet in general is adversarial because you you're literally you know putting a window or a door right here that billions of people can knock on and, and try to get through. This episode of Bitcoin People proudly brought to you by BitRefill, your one-stop shop for living on Bitcoin and Lightning and building out the Bitcoin economy and the Bitcoin standard world we would all love to see come to fruition. They've got all the best gift cards like Amazon, Apple, Bunnings, Airbnb, Uber, and much more. Coles and Woolies for your groceries, Bill Fairies to pay your bills, BP and Ampol for your petrol. You can do your hotel bookings or top up your phone credit or buy a gift or phone credit for a friend or loved one overseas. So check them out today, bitrefill.com and remember to include Bitcoin people in the referral code for 10% Bitcoin back on your first purchase. Yeah, uh, and maybe it's a case of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger because of course you find out where those weak points are. Mm -hmm. So from those kinds of attacks, you then experienced a very personal attack 2017. Can you talk us through what happened with that? With the, with, with the swatting, um, it's what invasion, I, I don't know quite what we call it. Um, and what do we know about the motives of the guy, I, I know you tracked him down eventually, you found out who it was. Do you know anything about his motives and why he went down that track? So if you could talk us through the experience and the unraveling of finding him. So the process, which was no easy process of then tracking him down. And then what you found out about him when you did finally meet him. 
Yeah, so, you know, despite me having a decent understanding of uh, you know, privacy leaks, mainly because my job for so many years had been to sift through all the data that gets collected, um, I had never really taken a particularly strong stance uh, protecting my privacy, you know, other than running things like ad blockers uh, to try to stop a lot of those metrics and, you know, getting myself off of all the email lists. But I didn't go to many extremes of like running VPNs or um, the much harder things that are around, you know, protecting your physical location privacy. So you know, what happened? Well, 2017 was really when all the scaling stuff was coming to a head. We had a number of different proposals and sort of threats on the table uh, to fork Bitcoin network. And at some point, I, I, I'll never know specifically what it was, but basically I said something uh, that you know triggered some people who must have been more on the large block uh, supporter side, and they, if we are to believe uh, you know what I was told, uh, they basically went uh, to their friend who had a history of swatting people and said, "Hey, you should swat this guy and screw with him because you know we don't like him," and and so according to him. He didn't even know who I was. He wasn't into the whole uh, scaling debate stuff. Uh, he was just, you know, a punk teenager who did this stuff for fun and possibly for profit. I, I do have plenty of reasons uh, from my research to suspect that he made a decent amount of money, basically extorting people, um, and and that was what he attempted to do with me. Um, though I did not send him uh, any money and instead i put a bounty on his head uh, which you know ended up helping me but uh it it took no it took like three or four years of investigation and a number of sort of lucky breaks to be able to track the guy down it was um it was not easy by any means especially really what i learned is that law enforcement uh doesn't really care about your problems if you're you know not in imminent danger uh, it's really hard to to prosecute you know sort of white collar crimes um it's also it's also very difficult to find attorneys that will you know act proactively on your behalf like the basically what i i found out is like the ma vast majority of of uh attorneys out there, if, if they're on the criminal side, they're either for, you know, defending people who are being, you know, prosecuted by the state, mm -hmm. um, or they are, you know, there to, um, if, if they're on the aggressive side, usually they are working for the state. So it's very hard to find like private attorneys that are prosecutorial and i was just lucky that i found one who was like a former state prosecutor who now had a private practice and so they had uh, some connections with private investigators and fbi and stuff but it was also it was just really hard to get the fbi's attention um certainly don't bother calling any of their main phone numbers because that won't get you anywhere but um yeah number of lucky breaks later and we, we end up you know I don't know. I forgot about it for like a year or two. Uh, and then I finally got a contact in the cybercrime division with the FBI, handed all of my findings over to them, didn't hear from them for like another year, thought, you know, that was it, nothing was going to happen. And then just r randomly out of the blue one day, I get a call from my attorney that says, well, they found him. Uh, and the, what was it? The, the the federal district attorney declined to prosecute because they're a minor uh so apparently in america there is no like juvenile justice system at the federal level so like the prosecutor apparently doesn't they can't really do much um or it's not worth their time uh thankfully few more weeks went by and the, the state level district attorney said that they were interested in prosecuting and then i went through the whole 
rigmarole of you know flying there and testifying in court and so on and so forth but you know the the kid uh you had no record he had never been caught for anything before and if it wasn't for me he probably wouldn't have been caught you know for a while so uh he basically got a slap on the wrist and uh you know was was told he needed to clean up his act so hopefully he did uh i'll you know, probably never hear from him again but um i i don't hold too much animosity for him because you know he he was just a naive young kid. He, I don't think he fully understood the potential ramifications of what he was doing. No, that's right. And it's really more about the people who set him up for it. Uh, it occurs to me we haven't actually described here, and some people may not know what a swatting attack actually is and what that looked like. Mm. And my understanding is that you weren't actually at home at the time. I'm Correct. not sure if anybody was. Uh, I guess I'm curious about the emotions you went through at the time as you saw what was going on your road was blocked off you didn't even know it was your house uh, yeah. so if you could kind of describe a little bit about the scene uh what actually physically happened and what was your you've talked about your stoicism and how much that's helped you but i would imagine there's an element of ptsd after an event like that so I'm wondering what the emotional fallout was for you. So if you wouldn't mind kind of describing the process, but then those kind of immediate days or weeks afterwards and what went on for you, because you resolved very quickly to go after this guy. And I think you got quite sort of used that energy in a sort of focused, angry way to, you know, to regroup. And But, but that takes some doing to get to that place, I would imagine. So can you take us through that story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when it actually happened, it was surreal. Um, it was it was also a lucky break in that I had, I think it was a Monday morning. And in those days, I would get up at like five or 530 in the morning and go to the gym. And I had done that. And when I got to the gym, for whatever reason, I tweeted out something funny about Oh, it's another Monday, and we've still got, you know, block size wars in front of us for the whole week. And, and apparently, you know, the attacker saw that and made the assumption that I had just rolled out of bed. And so, you know, I was going to be at home for the next hour or so. And so they decided, you know, like 7 AM was the perfect time to strike. And so I was coming home from the gym and I run into a roadblock, you know, stop and talk to the cop and they're like oh we have a potential active shooter incident <laughs> and so i of course got uh, pretty concerned it wasn't uh until i don't know it took like another 20 or 30 minutes or so uh before we realized that you know they were actually looking for me they were you know at my address and i immediately knew what it was like i knew what swatting was um in fact like uh one of the early bitcoin developers was swatted in 2014 so it wasn't even the first time that a, a bitcoin person had been swatted um swatting was more something that was happening in the gaming community but basically yeah. it's you know you you find your target you find out where they live and you call their local police department and you use the right words to you know create a highly escalated situation so in in my case he said um i think he said i had killed somebody and i had hostages and i had bombs and i was demanding like fifty thousand dollars or something but basically you know just go down the list you know just tick all the boxes you know this is a highly uh dangerous mentally unstable person who is barricaded in with hostages so we have to send our highest level of threat response which is the SWAT team and uh, shut down their entire neighborhood with hundreds of houses so um you know I I knew what that was and in fact like when I jumped up into their mobile command unit I was like 
sorry for the trouble, everybody. <laughs> you know, uh, the first thing they asked me was, do you have any enemies? And I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I like, I have a pretty good idea of like why you're all here. Yeah. Okay. So you've weathered more than your fair share of storms. And I know that you've reorganized your life to increase the level of privacy, um, at a particularly at a personal level. Uh, you're now since Casa, well, you're still, it seems to be a, a constant in your life, perhaps I was going to say, it seems to be back with pushback that you get around altcoins, your stance on ordinals, your stance on uh, layer two experimentation and technologies. So there seems to be this kind of constant pushback and maybe that's what it needs to be. I mean, you've said the internet and Bitcoin is naturally adversarial and maybe that's what it needs to be in order to cons consistently test itself and be pushing back against ideas and always questioning and always testing but that's got to be tiresome from your end yeah i mean it requires a certain level of commitment right so uh, a lot of the people who were around and you know were more prominent back then aren't so prominent anymore they in many cases they just got tired of of dealing with the the constant battles as it were um yeah you know, i believe that this is one of if not the most important thing that i can be working on right now um yeah. and if i really want to i can always take a break but i don't know it's, it's also kind of an addiction um <laughs> it's um it is I believe, you know, a battle of ideas. And so if I don't know if you've been paying attention to some of the most recent drama, but in many cases, like even in the past couple of weeks with the recent drama, I haven't even been making arguments for or against the specific proposal that people are talking about. Rather, most of the time when I'm commenting, it's more meta commentary of like, you know, this is a logical way to approach, you know, debate, or, you know, this is an irrational, emotional way of approaching debate. And so, you know, I'm thinking of it more of, I, I guess you could call it thought leader, because I, I'm really, I'm like, I'm talking about how we should be thinking about things rather than necessarily prescribing that we go one way or another. Oh, how fascinating. So you've really become expert over time at how to manage these things and are now able to teach that on the basis of your experience, um, which is really a, a kind of stunning outcome from the process and a positive and a productive outcome from the process. Again, it's kind of channeling it into cha channeling many negative experiences into a really positive outcome for Bitcoin, for the community, for yourself, for the people around you. Um, I mean, really it's also been an interesting yeah. journey because my you know social media profile grew so much. Um, it is yes. a very different experience being on a social network and having 100 followers versus 10,000 followers versus 100,000 followers. I, I, you know, I noticed, you know, marked differences in, uh, the reactions that you would get and just sort of the volume of responses and of course, edge cases. And so one thing that I've said many times, uh, especially about the swatting incident is that it's not a new thing, you know, um, you know, celebrities have always had stalkers, for example, yeah. but pre-internet that was, that was limited to a you know, mega celebrity problem, you know? Um, and this is basically an issue of attention. So thanks to the internet, um, you can very easily go from being a nobody who no one is paying attention to to, you know, if you're fortunate slash unfortunate enough to go viral, uh, you can have either the praise or the wrath or probably some of both of millions of people directed at you overnight. Mm -hmm. 
And, and it's really, it's, it's, it's the fact that your life can change so suddenly as a result of the attention um, that, you know, this is what catches people unaware. And it's one of the reasons why I think privacy is so important and it's hard to, to overstate. Um, the average person will probably go most of their life, uh, you know, never having to deal with this type of problem, but you can almost think of it as being a, uh, a loser of the social media lottery, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, if you do or say something that triggers people in the right way, then you may find that due to the law of large numbers, and I still am optimistic. I believe the vast majority of people are good moral people who don't want to hurt others. But there is some small, you know, single digit, maybe even less percentage of people out there who they don't abide by the same ethics. Uh, they don't have problems, you know, attacking others in order to try to achieve some end. And so, you know, that's the real reason why I got swatted is because I had so much attention and, you know, I, I triggered enough people that eventually one of them who had the skill set to pull off the swatting and had the you know, right mental frame of mind to want to actually do it. Uh, mm. you know, that's what happened. And because I didn't have the right defenses in place, they were able to pull that off. Now, you know, years and tens of thousands of dollars and many lifestyle changes later, I am confident that that type of person can't pull that off against me again, but it really is a, a high bar to cross over. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, I want to move towards something a bit more optimistic and I want to come back to kind of Bitcoin and what it means for the world and your original reasons for getting into Bitcoin, being driven by that sense of justice that you were. So this is a two part question. Uh, in 2012 or 2015, could you have imagined Bitcoin being where it is today? in terms of global adoption and politicians talking about their policies like for, for Bitcoin in the 2024 election. So could you have imagined that? And second part, therefore, predicting forward, what do you imagine another 10 years from now? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the pace has caught most of the early adopters by surprise. I mean, we we sometimes had these discussions of you know where might this thing go over the long term but i generally had more of a generational take on it. i was like you know maybe 30 you know 20 30 years from now it'll be pretty big um you know also that's that's kind of the the lifespan of the average fiat currency is like 20 25 years so i'm like you know if if Bitcoin can survive past that, then it's really proven itself to be better than, than fiat and at least that way. So it's hard to imagine because you know, humans experience time and experience things linearly. Our brains extrapolate things linearly. So it's very difficult for us to you know, predict a rate of change that is actually exponential. Mm. So yeah, I, it's, it's hard for me to even imagine. I, I, I try not to get my heads in the, in the clouds too much because I've seen some people who try to you know, put on their exponential thinking cap and then they can take it too far. And they're like, oh, we're all gonna be millionaires next year type of thing, you know, it's like, um, so I try to stay more focused on the short term and what I can do to, to keep pushing forward. And, and the sort of hope is that if there are enough other people out there like myself who are contributing whatever skills they have, you know, you don't have to be technical to be contributing to this space. You know, look, look at yourself. Uh, I don't know if you consider yourself like a historian or a sociologist or whatever, but you know, we're all contributing in our own way, trying to improve the system, trying to help others understand what it is. 
And, you know, if you're helping other people understand it, then perhaps, you know, that will have a domino effect of getting some of those people to contribute their own skills. And, and, you know, this is how you get the network to grow, not just linearly, but also, you know, exponentially. It's, it's almost like a reverse Ponzi scheme, right? If like you get two people and they get two people and they get two people, you know, everything to the power of two, um, you know, that's how things really start to go crazy. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, Bitcoin has these crazy up and down market cycles. And I think that that is going to continue for the foreseeable future. I don't normally ask this question of people, but you've been through three halvings. So I have to ask you, I need to ask for a price prediction <laughs> for maybe 10 years from now, let's say 2033. Yeah, I mean, I don't do price predictions uh, because we don't know what's going to happen to fiat, right? Um, right? Right. My my only conviction is not that Bitcoin is going to keep going up in price. My only conviction is that the value of fiat is going to keep going down in in price. Mm -hmm. So you know, even if I said you know, Bitcoin is going to be worth a million dollars 10 years from now, that actually doesn't mean very much because it's possible that a million dollars isn't worth the same as it is today. And, and not only possible, it's basically guaranteed. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And it's the right way to look at it. That makes a great deal of sense. And it ties into what, well, I'm just going to say Greg Foss, but many folk in the Bitcoin community uh, we know that fiat, if nothing else, is trending towards zero. So, you know, uh, it doesn't leave much choice. Uh, it doesn't leave much choice in terms of the average person looking around for investment options and uh, living their life in some sort of uh, reasonable manner. Jameson, yeah. <laughs> where to next for your personal journey? What are, you go, what are you working on and what do you want to be working on? So you're saying you don't have a specific vision necessarily for, for a Bitcoin world, as it were, but what's your particular vision for yourself? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of my time is just focused on my company um, and, you know, I'm not a business savvy person, you know, thankfully I'm not CEO. I would be a terrible CEO, um, having to, you know, deal with all of those different moving parts and especially mm -hmm. deal with the sort of human, uh, you know, relationships side of things. But, um, you know, my goal is to continue surveying the landscape of what is available from a technology perspective and figuring out if there's, if there's room for me to make it easier for people to use some of the tooling that still holds great power and holds great potential. And so, you know, in, in terms of like what CASA does or, you know, what I want to do, you know, I kind of, I kind of see CASA as like a, an extension of a consulting service you know i have people come to me all the time who want me to do consulting for them but i'm like you know this is what casa is for it's you know security consulting like i do brain dumps on our employees they learn from our clients and, and teach me about you know what people are having problems with um you know we are all together trying to navigate the very dangerous and complex world of of being your own bank and we're trying to make it easier and allow people to be more confident that they can do it because i see this as a it, it can become an existential crisis if we don't constantly fight the battle because really what the battle is it's a battle of uh sovereignty versus convenience mm -hmm. and the unfortunate thing and the reason why i'm kind of bearish on security and privacy in general is because 
The past decade has taught me that humans tend to prioritize convenience over everything else, <laughs> even when it's you know in their best interests not to do so. Um, this is just human nature, and this is why it needs to be as convenient as possible to be your own bank. But um, you know, even stepping back from that, I do believe that you know Casa and my own journey will it'll be much bigger than just Bitcoin or just crypto assets. You know, fundamentally, the technology of cryptography has the potential to change many different aspects of our lives. You know, at, at a societal level, it has, you know, helped to secure internet commerce as we know it. Uh, but the internet itself is still a crazy and dangerous place. And there are many, many different um, areas that, that need room for improvement. And, and so I think that we're going to see you know, cryptography and the technologies that come out of this ecosystem be used to help people empower themselves in other ways. So, you know, one example, uh, social media, I'm a big fan of Noster now, you know, this is using public private key cryptography. Um, it's creating a completely different, more decentralized architecture for how we actually send and store the, the data for uh, social networking. And even more than that, like it's actually much more than just a social network. Um, I, I especially think that you know, we will eventually land on some sort of identity solution. This is one of those unicorns, like a number of different teams have been working on for, for years and we have yet to settle on a standard. But I think that one of the big missing pieces to this whole sovereign ecosystem that we're trying to build on the internet is identity and reputation. Um, but we need to, to, to settle on exactly what system we're going to use for that. And uh, it better not be WorldCoin is all I can say. <laughs> it had better not be WorldCoin indeed. Uh, Jameson, you've been enormously generous with your time, as you always are with these interviews. You're incredibly patient um, and, and giving in terms of your knowledge and your insight and your capacity to explain in very plain English and simple terms for us non-techies. Um, you are um, a resource in your own right. You've, you have a page that brings together all the most amazing resources in Bitcoin. Um, do you have any last words or final thoughts or something that's really top of mind for you at the moment or something you'd like to get out there to anyone who might be listening who may be newer to this space? Um, basically, you know, don't get overwhelmed. Don't bite off more than you can chew. There's no rush on any of this. Um, you can dip your toes in. Um, you know, the most important thing that I think you can invest in is education. And so that's why I, I spend time almost every day, you know, updating my resources website. Uh, every time I find a new tool or a new educational resource, I put it on there, not just for everyone else. Like I initially started doing this for myself just because I wanted to be able to keep track of everything uh, and, and be able to answer questions when people came to me so that I didn't have to you know, go Googling all over the internet. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no rush. You don't have to feel overwhelmed. You don't have to be technical. I, I think if you start going down the rabbit hole, if you think that you know, this technology, the ideas behind these systems are interesting, if you think that this, is perhaps a better way for us to try to move civilization forward in some aspects. I, I think that you should try to find a way to contribute and, and there's many ways to do that. There's many companies out there that are looking for all types of different skill sets. You know, you don't have to be a programmer by any means and, you know, anything you do contribute is going to help us uh, get to where we're, we're all trying to go. So it can be adversarial, especially if you're trying to you know, talk to people on social media, but, um, 
this is a voluntary system, right? You you don't owe anything to anyone. Uh, you know, if someone is is being mean to you, you can just stop talking to them. And I do that all the time. I wish I could even tell you how many thousands of accounts I've blocked and muted over the years, but Twitter <laughs> won't make that easy for me to find out. I'm just starting doing that recently. I'm only just learning how to do that and how to manage that. Jameson, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much and go well and and be well and keep doing what you're doing. You're an amazing, amazing resource to this space. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I think that orthodoxy interprets aid and development as being wasteful, but probably good intention. That's probably what most people think of when they think about aid. But a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, only a certain percentage of the money I send gets to the recipient. We should be doing more. That's what you hear a lot about in the mainstream economic orthodoxy is we're not doing enough lending to poor countries and we're not giving them enough capital and we're not giving them enough aid. That is profoundly incorrect in my view, in as much as the aid and development industry as a whole is mainly lending, not gifts.